So good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining uh, this uh, conversation on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I know that the Congo issue is um, a hot topic and uh, can create a lot, of, and many people have different views on what needs to be done. As a background to our conversation today is the crisis in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. On March 29th, the UN helicopter carrying six peacekeepers went down in M23 controlled area. It was alleged that M33 rebels are the one responsible for the death of the peacekeepers who were in that helicopter. In the meantime, the Congolese government had taken hostage two of Rwanda's army personnel and declared that indeed the war that was being waged was an invasion by the Rwandan government. Those allegations were quickly uh, refuted by the Rwandan government. However, a UN report that was issued on June 16 of this month clearly says that there have been evidence of Rwandan military on the Congolese territory on the side of the rebel group called M23. The ongoing crisis is not a new phenomenon, but more than 20 years old conflict. Many analysts believe that there is a major plan not only to destabilize Congo, but also the possibility to take a portion of the Congo, either annex it to neighboring country Rwanda or make a, a, an independent um, country. All this has resulted in the death of multitude of Congolese people. All this has resulted in loss of economic development for the Congo. Rwanda is and has been a player in the destabilization of the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's not a secret because indeed, Congo started, uh, uh, Rwanda started its invasion in 1996. Uh, in coalition with Uganda. So today we are going to discuss at length with experts in this topic. I am going to introduce you to Father Rigobert Minani, who is a Jesuit priest and has just finished his studies here at, in Washington, DC, uh, deepening this question of insecurity and accountability for the Congolese people. And it is our pleasure to welcome him uh, to hear his analysis, his take on this conflict. Father Rigobert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure that my, my, uh, my connection will be as stable as yours. I will try to do my best. So uh, I think one of the questions that uh, I've been asked is what is behind all these 20 years, more than 20 years of, uh, of uh, Rwanda being involved in the DR Congo? Uh, because as you said, the, uh, this, uh, the last uh, event uh, of M23 is something that is, uh, is not new. Uh, M23 was there from uh, even 2012. So for me, uh, it is good to understand uh, what is the interest uh, uh, of Rwanda on being destabilizing DRC Congo, the eastern part of Congo. 
in my view uh, and what i'm saying is some what i've said to the the, the this uh, uh uh the mr blinken when when he came here to to drc it's good to understand what what has been the narrative of mr kagame from the time he took power in rwanda and uh in my view uh he is stuck in a kind of narrative that he has developed and is trapped in his own narrative. And this has made things more difficult for them to, uh, to be and to go out. The first element, I should say, it, uh, I think people, they, 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 they remind that uh, when uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Kagame and, his, uh, and the military came from Uganda, um, they were, uh, a group that were more uh, balanced in a kind of ethnic uh, compositions. But as soon as they took power, uh, he decided to, the first, uh, for, for me, the first mistake, he decided that there were no uh, Hutu and Tutsi anymore. At least it was forbidden in Rwanda to speak about it. This could work if uh, Hutu and Tutsi were only in Rwanda. But unfortunately for him, Hutu and Tutsi are in Burundi, are in DRC, are in Uganda, and in Tanzania. Uh, so trying to, uh, to, to, uh, to recreate a new narrative of the composition of a country was something very tricky. There is reason be behind that. One of the reasons is because uh, uh, it was one of element that was used maybe during the genocide, but also there is uh, there is uh, uh, um, um, politics behind. Uh, one of the things I can see on the ground is the fact that uh, when you say there is no Hutu and Tutsi anymore, uh, then uh, you can put as much as Tutsi you want or Hutu or you, or you want, and uh, no one will 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 uh, uh, will complain. But in the same time, uh, in a country like Burundi, the composition of ethnic group was the base of uh, uh, political bargaining and change of and uh, and uh, uh, share power. So this was the first element for me, and uh, the narrative is still there today in Rwanda. You, you it is not written in the ID or your ethnic group. Today in Rwanda, you cannot even uh, refer to that. It is uh, uh, it's a crime for them. This was the first uh, trap. The second, you remember that when the, the, the group that came from Uganda and they took power in Rwanda in 94, uh, uh, they were all of them uh, uh, English speaking, they were speaking English. And it was not 10% of the population, it was less than uh, even 8% of the population. But when they took power, in order to keep uh, a kind of uh, uphand on the government or all the, 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 all the, the machinery of the country, they decided to change the language. Uh, 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 Rwanda was a, a country that had uh, French as a, a administrative uh, uh, um, uh, language. Uh, they imposed the, the less than 10% of the people who came, they imposed the language they knew. It was, it, we can understand that. It was, they could speak English, so they decided that everybody has to go and they speak uh, English. Today, when you, you, you meet a new generation of Rwandese, most of them don't speak any French anymore. So this is the second, the second narrative. The third narrative uh, is uh, the fact that, uh, um, uh, the fact that they were not Hutus anymore and Tutsi anymore, uh, the fact that uh, the, 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 the language became only Kenya Rwanda, not even English and French, even if the, the hierarchy, the elite, will be the one speaking English, then it was possible to harmonize the way of address to, uh, to have a say on what was happening in the in DRC. So from that time, uh, uh, they developed uh, they developed a kind of for policy that uh, instability in DRC was something that was uh, uh, to be kept. Why? Because since they are those having upper hand on the government and the politics. They are the minority of the minority. They don't recognize that they're a minority because they don't claim it. They don't even uh, uh, accept that one. They need to find a way for them to be 
controlled, but not be questioned by anybody. Uh, when you go, uh, uh, I was very amazed in the Central Republic last time I was there, I could see the troop, Rwandese troop in there. You will see that all the, the, the leadership, all of them, they are almost Tutsis. So to manage that, you have to have, to have, have a very strong narrative that you are pushing uh, behind. Be, behind. So, uh, so the question of having the violence in DRC and uh, having uh, uh, intervention uh, in DRC, it is linked to this kind of narrative where um, Rwanda is not able today uh, under the leadership of Kagame to work uh, to play the same game like all the countries in the region. They cannot go in democracy. They cannot go in a system where it will be one man, one voice. It is impossible because when they will go in that, that direction, they've seen what has happened in Burundi. Uh, they know how to keep people quiet, even if they are not content, cannot be uh, sustained for a long time. So uh, 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 it is good for them to have a system where uh, uh, securocrat, those have, uh, running the security uh, are, are those who have a say. Uh, um, and then, uh, so behind, behind the, uh, the, the question of, uh, of, of uh, having the control of East, well, one of the things that is very known, it is the looting of natural resources. But the loot, loot, looting of natural resources, it's something it has built the Kigali. If you go to Kigali to say today, it's a very modern city. Uh, those who have seen it in 1994, they know that it was totally, totally different. But where uh, Mr. Kagam was very clever, he has been able to develop a kind of two ways of uh, addressing his own uh, challenges. One, it was to get money that is not counted. That this come from the looting in the from DRC, and this it is run especially by the military. They had uh, in position in Rwanda for many years a, a general who was in charge of desk Congo and was in charge of looting. So it was clear uh, at that time. But the other side, there will be, and for that, this Kagame has been very successful. Had been able to run in very. Uh, um, transparent way, what you will get from the West. So from the, when the West, they will come to us, he will say, I'm running things very, very, uh, 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 um, uh, in, in very transparent way, because money coming from the looting in the DRC, it is something that keep the military and the elite leadership, most of them who came from Uganda, to have the power of having those full control of the country and uh, having, being able to, continue creating chaos and disorder in the, in the DRC. And the, the, we can say the pillar of his, his, uh, the, the power in Kigali is this, this group of James Kabarebe and the others who are uh, the pillar of, uh, of, uh, um, of the politics in, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the country. So um, today, uh, if we want to help uh, the peace in, in the DRC, in the eastern part of the Congo, in, I think his network is not stable enough. No, we lost him. Uh, looks like we lost him completely. No, no, he's back. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I think I was lost. Uh, I was lost somewhere, isn't it? Yes, you were saying I was, you want I, to help. Uh, I was the connected. Yeah. Yes, you so were saying. For, that yeah, that I, will, I will. I'll, I'll wrap up. I, I think for me, it is good for him to. To, to, to change the narrative, uh, to be more, uh, to, to, to me be more uh, aware that his legacy that he has built for more than 20 years now out of what we could call a post-genocide situation can be longer uh, sustained by anybody, nobody in the region, nobody in, around, the, uh, around the region, nobody even among the, the, its own partners outside. Uh, and then start to rebuild from what has been for all of us. It is uh, to have a democratic country, to have uh, a freedom of uh, association, freedom of, of, of uh, political activities, uh, uh, and uh, to, to be more uh, uh, 
transparent in the way that they address um, the question of security in the region. In, in the region. If it doesn't go in that that uh, that line, uh, future be very very uh, be very bad because what I can see today uh, uh, in DRC, I've been absent myself for ten years. Local population, especially young people, are very very nervous, and it is not only in Congo; it is also in Burundi; it is also in Uganda. And this situation cannot be sustained for, uh, for a number of, 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 of years. So I think the way out, it will, it will be just democracy, not, not other thing. There is no other way that uh, uh, a, a group of people um, uh, using the military force and security force can keep uh, uh, power, keeping the control of the world, creating confusion in the whole region, and uh, and be successful successful for uh, for uh, uh, a number of years. It will it it cannot work for a long time. I think I I will stop there to to let others to to complete. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Rigobert. Uh, we appreciate your perspective on the Kagame narrative. I have uh, a number of questions I would like you to clarify. Um, you focused on, you know, Kagame's own, own uh, world, but you did not um, speak to the issue of the DR Congo government. Why is it that for 20 years, the DRC government, which has the obligation to protect its borders and citizens have not been able to do so. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I wanted to, to, to uh, stress on the narrative of, uh, of, of uh, Mr. Kagame because I have the impression after reading a number of uh, documents uh, uh, among the experts and the researchers, most of the people, they don't address this issue and for me, it's the key element. But there is also a number of things to, to complain from the side of DRC government. Uh, DRC government was not able to, um, to, uh, to secure the eastern part of Congo and to function normally. And this, it is linked to a kind of a policy of to spoil DRC. It is good to know that um, after uh, uh, the first rebellion, so the, the, the one of 96 of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Afdel, we had here in Kinshasa as the chief of, of the staff of the army, Mr. Kabarabe, who was the one started to try to reorganize. And the first thing they've done at that time, it was to destroy the few elements of structural army that we had from the time of Mobutu. So this was the beginning of the collapse of the security apparatus in the, in the DRC. The second element that came, uh, it was after uh, the, the, the negotiation, uh, after the uh, uh, Lusaka agreement, Lusaka agreement was negotiated between DRC Congo and, uh, and, uh, and the neighbors country where we had invaded Congo at that time. And it was so, so an, a, a kind of unbalanced uh, uh, agreement that uh, DRC accepted at that time uh, because it was in a position of weakness and that has, has undermined our uh, uh, service secretary. So we have today uh, in the DRC government and DRC army, a number of the people who are former uh, member of the army of, of Rwanda, we have kept a number of relations of, of neighbors country. So this has forbidden the DRC to, to build a, 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 new, a, a new army. And when every time when you want to clean the army, they will complain that there is xenophobia in the, in the DRC. So it, was, it is almost impossible to, 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 to bring. It was uh, uh, one set from, from, uh, from LCD, one set from MLC, and one set from, uh, from, from, uh, from the, the side of the government. This has undermined a lot. The third is the fact that DRC has gone, even if with his own uh, uh, weaknesses, DRC has went through three electoral cycles that was almost competitive 
I want you to tell me if you've seen that for the 20 years in Rwanda. Uh, so when you are in a, in a competitive democracy, you don't have all the possibility of organizing and do everything you want because there is fighting inside the country itself. And third, for me, it was because uh, something it is very, or today, very documented and very known is the fact that Rwanda has planned for a number of years to create, uh, uh, to have the control of the Eastern Congo, to destabilize the, the, the Eastern part of Congo, to undermine the state in the Eastern part of Congo, because it is linked to what they call the existential life. They know, they said, one, this I'm saying, I'm saying about the Kagame apparatus because I focus on this because for me it is very important. Uh, they know that the way, the day they will lose this capacity of creating confusion in the eastern part of the Congo, then the their, their regime will disappear. So for a number of years, they've built a very uh, um, rational uh, way of destabilizing the eastern part of the Congo. Uh, uh, and that's why even if uh, 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 people, they speak about it, the uh, FDLR, it's true that FDLR was, were, were stronger in a certain time, but today we have a number of the, the data that know, know that uh, some, there is many FDLR who are, be, who are uh, 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 bought by by Kagame regime, Kagame regime him, himself. So uh, it's something that is very important to understand. And for me, it, it, it is linked to, and people have to understand that it is linked to the will of a small group of people who want to survive and keep power forever, and who cannot open themselves to a game of democracy that the world wants. So for me, uh, the weakness of Congo is there, but it's, it is it is there because Congo accepted to play uh, 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 the democracy game. And this could, could not help them to build, to rebuild everything they want to build. There is way to go there, it's clear. That's why we in, uh, in civil society in DRC, we focus a lot, we concentrate on the question of uh, uh, democracy, electoral process, uh, 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 and uh, transparent elections. Uh, because this is to be the way for us to come out of this situation and to have a country, a leadership that can build the country and put uh, uh, on fit the army. But we have the other side, people who are for 20 years, they've uh, planified, organized, reflect, coordinate uh, uh, insecurity in the eastern of the part of the Congo. So it is very complicated for a leadership in Congo to come out of the situation. Thank you. Uh, we are very happy with um, our brother, Father um, Rigobert Minani's input. We are going now to go to um, Maître Omar Kavota. Omar Kavota is in uh, Beni, uh, one of the hot spots of the, 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 the crisis. Many of you might have seen the pictures coming from uh, Beni, whereas people are being beheaded, disemboweled, and even more uh, graphic uh, way of killing uh, uh, others. Uh, Omar Kavota is known to be a moderate and uh, honest uh, analyst. He does not take into account his ethnic group uh, interest, unlike many people I know, he tells it how it is, no matter the interests of this or that, including his own uh, uh, ethnic members. So Omar Kavota, please give us the latest update on what is going on, particularly in the light of the recent um, uprising of the people demanding the departure of the uh, United Nations peacekeeping. Uh, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Uh, Omar Kavota is going to speak in French and I'll be translating for him. Thank you. Uh, uh, Débloquez votre micro, s'il vous plaît. Okay. Ça va. Ça va. 
OK, vas-y. Merci. Bonjour et merci de nous avoir accordé cette opportunité de pouvoir participer à, à ce débat. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to participate in, in this uh, debate. Comme le titre même de du sujet aujourd'hui et c'est maintenant qu'il faut mettre fin à cette violence, c'est ce désastre qui oppose, qui nous met à conflit entre la RDC et le Rwanda. Nous pensons que le désastre a trop duré et il est temps qu'on qu en finisse. Et donc, je serai heureux de partager avec vous euh, brièvement sur le contexte et également sur quelques pistes de solutions pour qu'on qu mette fin à cette violence qui n'a que trop duré. Uh, as it is said in the title, it is time for uh, in, to put an end to this uh, uh, crisis, this uh, issue that is opposing uh, uh, us and the, and the Rwandan government. I will be speaking to this issue and also proposing some uh, solutions. Il est vrai que ce qui attend à distance, peut-être ils peuvent encore se s'en douter, mais la RDC, la République démocratique du Congo, fait aujourd'hui face à l'agression par le Rwanda, et cette agression est couverte par le M23. C'est comme ça qu'il est dit en certains lieux que le M23 a de nouveau agressé la République démocratique du Congo, alors qu'on sait que c'est une énième invasion euh, de notre voisin le Rwanda qui utilise le label M23 pour aujourd'hui occuper un des territoires de la RDC. Et cela fait presque 85 jours maintenant que nous parlons. So, people uh, listening to the news from far might doubt, but it is a fact that the DRC has, is uh, fighting an invasion war against, the, uh, against Rwanda. This invasion is under cover of the, the rebel group left, um, called M23. Et nous le disons, le groupe, le Rwanda, à travers le M23, occupe le territoire de Ruchuru, vraiment une bonne partie du territoire de Ruchuru dans la province du Nord Kivu, depuis au moins 85 jours à, à compter de la date d'occupation. Uh, we can say that uh, Rwanda, through the M23, has now occupied one of Congo's territory, the Ruchuru territory, for at least uh, uh, 80, 85 days since uh, the invasion. Ça ne sera pas pour la première fois parce que vous vous en rappelez, en 2012 et 2013, le Rwanda a réalisé la même aventure à travers une agression qui avait, euh, à travers laquelle le territoire de Ruchuru, le territoire de Niragongo, et pour un moment, la ville de Goma avait été occupée. Cela avant d'être chassé en décembre 2013 par l'armée congolaise, le FRDC, avec l'appui de la brigade d'intervention de la MONUSCO. Mais dix ans après, le M23 revient et il réédite son exploit. Et nous le disons, ce n'est pas le M23, véritablement c'est le Rwanda qui utilise le nom du M23 pour tenter la énième aventure. Uh, this is not the first time. You will remember that uh, the latest was in 2013, 20, 2012, when Rwanda, uh, through the M23 again, occupied the territory of Miragongo, Ruchuru, and the city of Goma. And, uh, and uh, it was through the intervention brigade of the United Nations and with the Congolese army that they were defeated in 2013. En 2013, lorsque le M23 a occupé le territoire, donc lorsque le Rwanda, sous le nom du M23, a occupé le territoire congolais, au moins 2 millions 500 personnes ont été réfugiées à travers les États de la région de Gralac. Je vais citer 
euh, donc des réfugiés au Rwanda, des réfugiés en Ouganda, d'autres au Kenya et en Tanzanie, et au moins 2,5 millions de personnes ont fui le territoire congolais pour être des réfugiés. Au moins 1 million de déplacés internes ont fui leur territoire pour se retrouver soit à ville de Goma ou dans d'autres endroits de la République. Mais nous avions dit à Sota que c'était largement suffisant, qu'il fallait arrêter. Malheureusement, dix ans après, le même Rwanda veut nous ramener sur ces malheurs que nous avons vécu. Nous pensons que le monde doit dire « fait à cela ». And uh, you will remember that um, in, 20, the, in 2012, when Rwanda um, um, invaded the, the Congo again, at least 2,500,000 people were, fled the Congo into neighboring countries, namely Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, and so on. And at least 1 million people became internally displaced in the DR Congo. Then we were fighting and demanding that this end. We have called for the international community to intervene and um, help to put an end to this. Now is the time. Et nous voulons rappeler que il n'y a jamais de conflit, il n'y a jamais de problème particulier entre le peuple congolais et le peuple rwandais, burundais, ougandais. Et donc, il n'y a jamais de conflit entre le peuple congolais et le peuple des États qui nous entourent. Mais il s'est toujours observé qu'il y a des dirigeants, malheureusement, de certains États voisins, comme le Rwanda, qui ne veulent pas cette harmonie et qui sont à la base de cette déstabilisation qu'il faut arrêter avant qu'elle n'embrase l'Assemblée de la Région. We have to remember and remind the international opinion that there have never been a provocation of the Congo against any of its neighbors. There have never been any conflict between the Congolese people and the peoples of different uh, countries neighboring us. In, instead, we see that governments in, this, the, in these uh, countries are continuing to provoke the Congolese people, uh, more specifically Rwanda. We must do everything in our power to make sure this uh, situation does not continue to, to, to be there. Nous croyons qu'il est possible de mettre fin à cette situation. Et si nous ne mobilisons pas le monde entier pour y mettre fin, nous craignons que d'autres problèmes puissent s'ajouter et nous amener à ne pas trouver la solution. Par exemple, je vais mentionner cet autre problème qui est réel, mais qui est peu connu du monde, c'est le terrorisme islamiste qui est en train d'envahir l'Est de la RDC qui se vit aujourd'hui dans la province du Nord-Kivu et dans la province de Lituri à travers ce groupe, ce groupe qui s'appelle ADF-MTM et qui est la branche de l'État islamique en République démocratique du Congo. Malheureusement, à travers les... Lorsqu'on fait face aux, à l'évasion, à l'évasion, de notre territoire par le Rwanda, ces problèmes du M23 risquent de devenir occulté un grand problème qui est une menace contre la paix et la sécurité qu'il faut pourtant endiguer avec les efforts de tous. Et nous disons donc qu'il faut arrêter avec cette crise entre la RDC et le Rwanda et ensemble que nous puissions nous occuper à mettre fin aux autres graves crises telle la présence des terroristes islamistes, ce qui est Daesh en République démocratique du Congo, ce qui est l'État islamique en République démocratique du Congo, qui envahit aujourd'hui le Nord Kivu et l'Itouri à travers le mouvement dénommé ADF-MTM. Malheureusement, nous sommes confrontés à ce terrorisme et le Rwanda 
au lieu de venir en appui aux efforts des Congolais pour arrêter une menace commune, le Rwanda vient ajouter une autre menace et nous nous croyons qu'il est temps qu'on dise fin à cette crise entre la RDC et le Rwanda et qu'on qu s'occupe d'une menace réelle qui guette la région, qui guette le continent et qui guette le monde, qui est le terrorisme émergent à l'est de la RDC. Uh, yes, I would like to even um, add uh, one more layer to what is going on. The invasion of the Rwandan government of the Congo has uh, worsened one of the threats that Congo is facing and that the region is facing in the world. This is the threat of the ADF. This is ADF MTN. This is a terrorist group that is linked to the Islamic State uh, that is well known uh, globally. And this issue has worsened since the invasion of the Congo by Rwanda because now instead of solving the issue of the Islamic terrorism, which is now in North Kivu and Ituri province, we have to be dealing with Rwanda. Rwanda should be helping to deal with this issue instead of destabilizing uh, Congo even more. Dans la même façon, dans, dans, dans le même ordre d'idée, je ne voudrais pas euh, dire que la MONUSCO qui a fait des années à RDC euh, mérite des éloges, mais je reconnais que la MONUSCO n'a pas fait assez pour amener la paix et la sécurité euh, à, à RDC. Cependant, lorsque j'observe des manifestations violentes pour chasser la MONUSCO, pour s'ajouter comme, euh, comme, euh, comme pour s'ajouter à ce problème euh, d'agression contre le M23, je me dis de plus en plus nous sommes en train de subir le coup de l'ennemi. Non seulement nous avons à nous défendre contre le M23, qui n'est autre que l'armée rwandaise ayant envahi la RDC, nous devons nous défendre contre les terroristes ADF, MTM, qui, qui sont la brache de l'État islamique, mais aussi de manière plus ou moins sauvage, on s'attaque sur la force onisienne. Et cette force onisienne qui, est, euh, euh, qui fait objet maintenant de menaces, ça pour autant. Hein, ça, pour autant que j'affirme qu'elle a été S'il vous efficace. plaît, arrête. S'il vous plaît, arrête un peu. Translate. OK. <laughs> um, so, I'm not uh, going to sing praises of the United Nations peacekeepers uh, in DRC um, because they have been there for a long time and they, they, their report card is not that good. They've been there and, they, and there is no peace. But unfortunately, there is a lot of agitation um, to demand the departure of MONISCO. And now adds another layer of, uh, of problem. Not only are we fighting against M23 Rwanda mm -hmm. and fighting against the Islamist terrorists, mm -hmm. ADF MTN, but now, the uprising inside Congo, all of this just complicates the matter. So this is not helpful at all. Je vais peut-être finir, uh, comme l'État n'est pas notre allié, en disant que les Congolais, nous croyons à la paix. Et nous savons que l'ensemble du monde croit à la paix et à la sécurité. Mais si nous ne dénonçons pas le mal, si nous ne décourageons pas les États ou les dirigeants qui encouragent la violence, nous risquons de s'aimer la violence à travers le monde et nous risquons de détruire les fondamentaux qui ont été 
construit difficilement. Nous voudrions donc dire que s'arrête la crise entre la RDC et le Rwanda. Et nous savons le puissance, les États-Unis, la Grande-Bretagne, la France, en fait, le, 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 je vais dire l'Union européenne et les autres partenaires qui croient à la paix, qui combattent le terrorisme, qui s'associent à la RDC dans la lutte contre le terrorisme et dans la lutte contre l'agression inutile qui continue à diviser le peuple alors que nous devons construire entre nous des ponts afin que nos peuples vivent la véritable paix et la sécurité. So, um, I know that time is not necessarily on our side. I would like to conclude by saying that the Congolese people believe in peace. We must denounce uh, all evil. Our silence uh, can be complicit and undermine uh, the gains already made. We must call on the superpowers like the United Kingdom, the US, and all the, the, the superpowers to help us in uh, uh, building this peace. We must build Uh, bridges of peace between our peoples. And this way we can all um, live at peace. I want to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Omar Kavota for his uh, contribution to this uh, uh, conversation. I'd like to um, uh, end this first uh, session of uh, this first part of our conversation by saying simply that Rwanda has invaded once more the DRC for no reason, unnecessarily unprovoked. The resurgence of M23 is not something that the DRC called itself upon or uh, attacked Rwanda in one way or another. The president of Congo, uh, Mr. Felicity Sekedi, has gone at length to even offer economic incentive to President Kagame. And analysts like myself were just looking at uh, President uh, Chitikidi then and saying, how can somebody go and kneel in front of a, a leader who invaded you? And that's how low the, pre low the President Chitikidi has gone. Has even gone to join the, uh, the, the East African community hoping that now being in one group, then they will not attack him. He was wrong. President Kagame can never be trusted. He shut down a plane that carried two presidents coming from a negotiation for peace, whereas they had just agreed for power sharing between the two ethnic groups that has forever been at war in Rwanda. He did not care. He shut down the plane. President Kagame came from the United Nations. It's well documented. And complained about the refugees, Rwandan refugees in Congo. He was offered assurances on how to deal with it. He did not care. He went on with the, the collaboration of Uganda and invaded the Congo. I would like to invite everyone to read the UN mapping report. You will have PTSD. Killings by machetes, by hammers, by all the tools that were burning people's lives. A hundred here, 300 here, the mass grave are full in that part of the, the country well documented by the United Nations and in the UN mapping report. Once again, Kagame is back, destabilizing a peaceful nation. Finally, I would say that the Congolese government has a role to play. Congo is big enough Unfortunately, those who are leading or who have been leading the country have not been responsible enough to prepare for peace. 
Instead, they have been preparing for their retirement, stealing and enjoying, instead of building uh, infrastructures of peace, namely an army that can defend the people. And here we are. We are begging for security from the international community. Our next panel, we discuss exactly this question. Can peace in DRC come from the international community or are there any other um, possibilities to end the crisis in the DRC? I would like to thank all of you for coming. Stay tuned. Uh, our executive director, uh, uh, Stephen Rogers, will lead us in the reflection with our, our panelists uh, in looking at the international community's role in the crisis and in the solution. Uh, Stephen, the platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bahati. Um, thank you for for this very warm, um, warm uh, initial background to um, the DLC and all of the dynamics, all of the trajectories. Um, I want to thank our two initial speakers who've come in and provided some really interesting perspectives on uh, their views, their backgrounds, their interests and um, on the DLC, as well as some kinds of um, um, potential resolutions. Um, there's always going to be a resolution to a conflict, no matter how long it is, no matter how much it has lasted. I think um, that's why we're here. Um, and the AFJN, that's our major, most important thing. We, we don't take, um, we don't necessarily take any part in the conflict. We do not necessarily endorse any aspect of the conflict. What we endorse is the overall, um, over, the overarching goal of, of, of um, how we can bring peace and uh, resolution to the people of DRC and, by the way, to the people of Africa. So I am very excited to introduce three really wonderful panelists um, who've had lots of experience um, writing about these issues, um, championing causes on these issues. And um, <clears throat> I am going to ask three of them to just initially make some quick presentations, uh, five minutes if they can, maybe no more than um, two minutes more. And then what I'll do is we'll open up and um, ask questions for all three of them, depending upon where the questions are coming from. So let me just briefly introduce um, three of our panelists. First, I'm going to start with um, Mr. Maurice Kenny. He is a co-founder and executive director of Friends of Congo. He has worked with the Congolese for over 15 years in the struggle for peace and justice and human dignity. And um, he has quite a lot of really good uh, anal analysis on Congo. I've, I've been in a few panels where he has really made some uh, contributions. He doesn't want me to talk about all he has done and I respect that. So I'm just gonna make it brief. And I would therefore ask Mr. Mr. Maurice Kenny to, to um, start the start the ball rolling. What we are going to talk about here is basically the international perspective about Congo. And let me just say this briefly as a way of entry point for them. Um, for those who are just joining and probably for those who probably are not very much grounded in conflict, these um, analysts will talk about it. But the DRC, which is the Democratic Republic of Congo, is the second largest country in Africa. It has been mirrored by conflict for decades. I can't even remember. It's a country of paradox is how I put it because um, it is a land so rich in natural resources, but yet its people are among the poorest in the world. And for those who are very familiar with conflict resolution or political economy of Africa, you know, we talk about the Dutch disease. It's almost like you're rich in natural resources, but yet it doesn't really reflect in the quality of life of your people. And this is also true for the country where I come from, Sierra Leone, where we had all the diamonds, and yet we were, because of conflicts and all the other interests, um, the country, the people, we are so poor and they are always married in conflict. So while the DRC with all of it, 64% of its population is extremely poor and they live on $1.90 a day or less. That's according to the World Bank. And let me start by saying that the views expressed by these panelists do not in any way reflect the views of the African population, uh, African um, of AFJN. So we want you guys to know that. And then with that, I am going to ask Mr. Kenny to start his opening remarks. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Uh, thanks, uh, Jacques, uh, as well, and uh, AFJN for pulling together uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, I, I believe uh, we cannot uh, have enough of this kind of discussion, uh, political education, information sharing about what has transpired 
in the Great Lakes region of Africa, at least for the past quarter century. And uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, the people in the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the Great Lakes region uh, of the African continent have been caught in a death trap. And uh, a death trap that uh, has been instigated by the allies of the United States. Allies of the United States uh, that have been armed by the United States uh, government, that have been financed by the United States uh, government, have uh, been provided intelligence by the United States government, been provided uh, equipment, military training. So the United States, as a result of its engagement with its allies, is directly implicated in the conflict that has unfolded in the Great Lakes region for the past 25 years at least. Uh, and one can, in its latest iteration, trace US policy uh, in the region uh, to the Entebbe Agreement, uh, where President Clinton uh, visited Africa in 1998, uh, had a meeting at uh, Entebbe, and out of the Entebbe meeting came uh, a certain policy document, uh, policy positions uh, that have uh, obtained uh, through subsequent administrations uh, from Bush to Obama to uh, Trump and right now through to, uh, to Biden. And that is where the US put its stamp of approval, its imprimatur on certain figures uh, in the region and held them up to the world as being a new breed of African leaders. I believe Madeleine Albright, then Secretary of State, and Susan Rice, then Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, called them the Renaissance leaders of Africa. And uh, among those, chief among them, were Yori Museveni of Uganda, who has spent more than three decades now in power, and Paul Kagame of Rwanda, who's exceeded two decades and uh, says that he was ready to serve for another two decades. So these are not democratic figures. These are not uh, figures that represent the values that the United States present to the world as being a, a democratic nation, but rather they're authoritarian figures. And just a, just a sliver, a slight example of that, the last election that uh, President Kagame participated in, he won 90, over 99% of the vote. And one of the women who challenged him to the presidency, uh, he threw her in jail and locked her up for daring to, to confront him. So even after, even though he's, he, he dominates the electoral and political landscape, if you raise any questions about him, that uh, he then uh, brings the full force of uh, the state uh, against you. So th these are the type of the figures that uh, the United States uh, has protected. And that's been part of, a fundamental part of the problem that where you have three structural impediments that contribute to the deepening and the perpetuation of the conflict in the region. And those three structural impediments are backed up by the force, the power, the credibility of the United States. And those impediments that uh, we at Friends of the Congo have articulated um, time and again uh, include a rampant impunity uh, throughout the region, uh, lack of accountability, that crimes have been committed and uh, the leaders uh, who are responsible for orchestrating the crimes haven't been brought uh, to, uh, to account. And this goes way back uh, in the case of uh, Paul Kagame to the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda, uh, where the crimes that the RPF uh, committed, Rwanda and Patrick Fung committed, uh, were shoved onto the, the carpet. And if any of the, uh, of, of the leaders of the uh, tribunal 
tried to uh, hold uh, Mr. Kagami and his uh, cohorts to account, they were dismissed uh, with the intervention and backing by the United States. So impunity, rampant impunity, lack of accountability, and then we have lack of justice. There has been no justice. And a classic case of the lack of justice where we see uh, both uh, Rwanda and Uganda invaded Congo twice, 96 and 98, and Congo brought charges against both nations uh, at the International Court of Justice. And in 2005, the Court of Justice ruled that uh, Congo was entitled to reparations because of the plunder, war crimes, crimes against humanity committed in the Congo by Uganda. And they would have ruled the same, uh, we believe, as it relates to, to Rwanda. However, Rwanda is not party to the court. So there is no recourse for justice on the part of the, of the, of the Congolese. And it is often stated that uh, Rwanda and Uganda are in Congo to protect their security interests. And uh, that's a casus belli that's put forward to justify uh, what they've, their invasions and their sponsoring of militia groups in the, in the Congo. However, Congolese are keenly aware that both Rwanda and Uganda fought each other in the so-called Six Day War in June of 2000 that killed over a thousand Congolese and injured scores. Now, if these countries were in the Congo going after the so-called FDLR, genocide there, and whatever militia groups that they're um, referencing, then why would they be fighting each other deep in the Congo in the city of Kisangani in pursuit of mineral riches. So that dispels any notion whatsoever uh, of the reasons given by the Rwandan government or Ugandan government for being in the Congo. The United Nations stated clearly in uh, 2001, in a series of reports in 2001, that uh, both Paul Kagame and Yari Museveni are the godfathers of the mineral exploitation of the, the Congo. Now there, they're not the, the end of the chain, they're the intermediaries because neither country processes, manufactures, or refines those minerals that are stolen. Uh, so they serve as middlemen uh, for multinational corporations where the minerals exit out of Congo. And that's the, the overriding interest that we see on the part of these nations as to why they continue uh, to uh, invade sponsor militia groups in, in the Congo so that they can continue to extract the resources that benefit their, their economies. So what the United States has done is provided diplomatic and political cover for these leaders so that we have not been able to get to the question of to end the impunity, so that we've not been able to uh, address the question of accountability. And so that justice has not been able to deliver it. And as long as, as long as the United States continue to arm, finance, train, provide intelligence, provide diplomatic cover, provide political cover, we will not see an end to the instability in the region and the conflict in the region. In fact, we'll go as far as to say that the Kagamis and the Musuvenis would not be able to do what they're doing in the Congo, in the Great Lakes region of Africa without, without the backing of the United States. So knowing that they have the backing of the United States and that they can act with impunity and that there will be no accountability, there'll be no justice, they'll continue to do what they do. If you notice, every time there's a militia group that goes in the Congo that's backed by Rwanda, Uganda, they go right back into Rwanda and Uganda. Lorna and Kunda, Mutubesi, uh, 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 Bosco and Tanganda, went back into Rwanda, even Sultani Makengo back into Rwanda. They all go back into Rwanda or Uganda and then they're, they're repurposed again as if this is something new. So this, these structural problems that we see in terms of that lack of accountability, in terms of that impunity, in terms of that lack of justice need to be addressed uh, forthright, confronted, and uh, unless they're addressed, we will not, we will not see peace. We will not see stability. We will not see security. So each and every one of us, the taxpayers in the United States, it is our dollars that are contributing to the fueling of the instability and the conflict 
in the region. So it's incumbent upon us to put pressure on our elected officials, on the US government, to let them know that uh, this is problem has going, been going on for a quarter century with the same players. The players have not changed. Museveni is still in power. Kagame is still in power. And however, we've gone through about at least four US presidents, but the US policy remains the same. So we need to put pressure on the US government in order to change US policy so that it can affect the change in the region and bring about the peace that the people are looking for, bring about the stability that the people are pursuing, bring about the justice that the Congolese and other people of the Great Lakes region are demanding. Thank you. Thank you so wonderfully. Um, I think um, I think Mr. Kani pretty much um, opened up this session with some really great analysis and especially the focus on the United States and its role in, um, in kind of, I would say, mentoring or raising dictators in developing countries or you know, other parts of the world where they have certain geopolitical interests, um, the naming of Kagame, the naming of um, Yoweri Misuveni, and, and I could say a lot of other um, a lot of other dictators that we have seen. And thank you for standing that up. And so um, what I'll do is to move on to the next to the next speaker, who is uh, who is going to kind of exp, um, analyze this more from his own lived experience. And we have Nikwa Akwete. Um, Nikwa Akwete chairs the security working group um, within ADNA. ADNA is an advocacy network for Africa, which is a coalition of other network and um, organizations that are interested in, uh, in developing issues in Africa or advocating, advocating for Africa. And he's also a graduate faculty at George Washington University. He was born in Ghana and an incorrig incorrigible pan-Africanist. His career as a DC-based activist is over 40 years, um, which began inside Trans-Africa, where he spearheaded the US anti-apartheid movement in DC. Um, he also shepherded, and I think he's very proud of this, uh, Oliver Tambo during the snowstorm, and he chaperoned three South African religious leaders to, the, to an Oval Office meeting. And hours after Mr. Mandela first arrived in DC, Nee was privileged to actually shake his hand. Since Trans Africa, Nee has created three non governmental organizations, and he has headed five in the US and Africa. He has closely monitored and widely analyzed African US issues and has taught undergraduate courses um, at George Washington University. It is our honor, Nee, to welcome you to um, AFJN and to do your five minutes presentation. And if you can just unmute, we'll be happy to, so that everybody will hear you. You're still on mute. Yeah, um, just go to the top and And by the way, while he's unmuted, if you have questions um, after the last presentation, we're going to open up so a few questions can come in and you can also send in the chat and then the panelists will be more than um, happy to respond. Nee, can you unmute yourself? Um, you're still muted. If you can just go on to the participants and then you click on your name, you will see the mute button. I think he's still, he's still trying to unmute. Can, can you hear me? He's having okay. some technical issues. Okay. Um, All right. So I think, I think he he's having technical issues. So, so what I'll do is while Nee is doing that, we'll get our third panelist um, who, if is ready, can just can just come in and then we'll try to take care of Nee. Unfortunately, you know, with Zoom, um, you can only do so much on your end. So he has to unmute himself. So I'm going to call on Mr. Claude uh, Gatebuke. Um, he has a very short introduction because he wants uh, pretty much uh, to talk more about the story. Claude is the co author of the book. Survivors on Censor. He is a survivor of the Rwandan war and genocide. And he is the executive director for the Africa Great Lakes Action Network. So Mr. Claude Gatsbuke, if you don't mind, I would ask you to unmute and then I'm start this conversation and then Neil will join you later on. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am honored and excited to be a part of this panel. Not I am, I am muted. All right. Um, 
maybe okay, okay miss mr new we'll, yeah. we'll just let come we'll let you come in after claude and um, claude um thank you so much go ahead claude yeah, it's a great honor to be on this panel with uh, both um, Maurice and me, but also to participate in this in this uh, large discussion and the whole discussion at large, not because of the subject that we're talking about, because I would rather be talking about other things and be talking about the, a thriving Africa with Congo doing really well and uh, being the in the heart of Africa and being one of the the the, the most recent you know, having all the, having the most resources on the continent and being able to feed the continent and do so much for the continent and the rest of the world. But here we are. Um, the excitement is the fact that we get to tell the truth unfiltered. Um, as you said, I'm the co-author of the book, uh, Survivors Uncensored. Um, and uh, when I um, heard everyone speak, especially, um, the uh, the brother from Beni, I actually got rid of my notes. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but I got rid of my notes because I wanted to give a perspective and put a human face to versus giving my analysis, which I will a little bit, I'll just summarize it. But I wanted to put a human face to the atrocities. Um, I survived the, the genocide in Rwanda and the war in Rwanda. Uh, when it happens, when such atrocities are happening, people suffer. I saw people dying, people getting killed, people getting hit with bullets, people getting hit with bombs, people getting blown up in, uh, in buses. And also at one point during the genocide, I was made to dig my own grave. Me and my mother were ordered to dig our own grave. Um, we were sheltered, thank goodness, by many people who uh, who uh, came and who would take us in. Um, so for the whole duration of the genocide, we were actually going from house to house, taking shelter with, you know, with different families. We were also running away from the various atrocities and massacres that took place. Um, <clears throat> at the place where um, I was made to dig my grave, nothing happened um, that I did myself or my mother did. It was the strangers around the area that rushed in and started yelling at the militias that were about to kill us. And they started yelling at them, telling them to stop, stop killing people, leave them alone. And we had been stopped on a pickup truck that they ordered to leave, but the pickup driver came back twice with two different men and those two different men negotiated for us to leave that place. And that's where I wanna take this conversation. That is our role. Our role is number one, to stop the bleeding in the Congo. Secondly, is to get a lasting solution to what is happening, not only in the Congo, but also in the region. We have to name the, um, the, the perpetrators we gotta call the dogs by their names. And we also have to make sure that whoever supports those perpetrators is, 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 is uh, that they stop the support. So um, to take it there, um, I wanted to piggyback off of Maurice's presentation because uh, he pretty much said a lot of the things that I also had prepared. Um, the fact that, and, and everyone pretty much who has spoken has demonstrated that the crisis we have in the Congo today is not the M23. The M23 is not a real rebel group. We have seen rebel groups in Africa. Um, Mr. Rogers, you are from Sierra Leone. When you see a rebel group that has a full uniform, they have, nobody's wearing a red t-shirt, nobody's wearing some, um, some, uh, some uh, flip-flops, Nobody is got a spear instead of uh, instead of a gun. These guys are well equipped. It's a it's a state military. What we have, the M23, is a is a um, is the government of Rwanda. It's the military of Rwanda and Uganda invading the Congo for the the countless number of times. And we have to call it the way it is. We have to call it by its name if we are going to and this conflict. Um, 
Secondly, there is some propaganda about the M23 representing minority rights. There is no majority group in the Congo. Every ethnic group in the Congo is a minority. There is, if, and, and when, you, when, you, when you go back, I wanna come back to now the international community. I'll start with us to reiterate what Maurice said, Rwanda and Uganda who are invading the Congo, causing insecurity and causing all kinds of trouble, displaced more than 2.5 million people, as the brother from Benin said, uh, outside of the Congo. And then another over a million, the last time I checked the statistics, internally displaced people in the Congo is 1.7 million people. I can relate to those people because at one point I was homeless and I was internally displaced and I was also a refugee outside of Rwanda. The fact that there's basically more than 4 million people who have been forced out of their homes by, the, by Rwanda and Uganda, two countries that do not manufacture weapons, two countries that whose economies cannot support a war the way it's conducted that are being killed by a rebel group that looks like a national army that, that actually, whose soldiers, by the way, Rwandan soldiers have been caught inside of the, um, you know, fighting with the M23. There was a, a UN group of experts that came out two weeks ago. When it came out, um, you know, uh, I was on a couple of uh, media engagements and I said, you know, I said this before, check my Twitter. At one point, the M23 was complaining that the uh, that their leaders were not involved in the negotiations uh, between the Congo and Rwanda and, and the others. And I said, no, the leader of the M23 was present at the meeting. It's Kagame, Rwanda's president. And so we have the leaders of the M23 in Rwanda and, Congo, and, and Uganda, and they're supported by our tax dollars. So the first thing we've got to do is agitate with the US government to stop supporting the two governments, especially any kind of military support. Recently, we saw uh, there was uh, Senator Menendez who actually uh, uh, wrote a letter with that request. I think we should push for that. We have to stop militarizing the region any, even more. Secondly, there is the UN. The UN has written multiple reports, including the most recent one that was leaked to the media. But there is the UN mapping exercise report that has more than 600 incidents. And to call them incidents is really an insult because these are massacres. This isn't 10 people getting killed. Even one person getting killed is terrible. But it's not one person getting killed. It's hundreds of people getting killed. It's genocide committed by the RPF, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, and it's written in that document. When you read the document, there's other atrocities committed between uh, various Congolese tribes, yet the Rwandan government is the loudest to protest against the mapping report because it exposes the crimes they've committed in the Congo. And so we must push for implementation of the recommendations of the mapping report. We have seen some good news on the continent, where dictators like Hussein Abre, who used to be a US ally um, and, and, and a Western ally, Blaise Compaore, and a number of others that I, I cannot name off right, right off the top of my head, getting tried for crimes they committed in the various countries. In fact, Charles Taylor was tried for crimes he committed in Sierra Leone, I believe. Um, so we have to work towards justice. Justice is what is going to bring lastis, lasting peace. When the perpetrators are held accountable, the Kagames, the Musevenis, they're generals, and made an example of, nobody is gonna have the, the, uh, the ambition to lead in the region using the methods that they have used, which is to kill, to massacre, to commit genocide, to wipe people out, to help the multinational companies plunder the region versus those resources uh, benefiting the people. So I want to stop there. Uh, it's two things. One, address the US government and make sure that at a minimum military support, minimum military support to Rwanda and Uganda stops. 
Secondly, you, push for the implementation and get some international tribunals to try the perpetrators of the crimes documented in the UN mapping exercise report. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Claude. I think um, it's, it is, I think it's um, I, uh, getting this information from a perspective of someone who actually was a, a victim of, I mean, a survival of, of this war. I, I don't think if there is a better way I could have, I mean, we could have actually had anybody um, say that. And you mentioned Sierra Leone, and I feel there's quite a lot of um, a lot of lot of similarities between the wars in Sierra Leone and what happened in um, in DRC. In the sense that you know you had countries that were neighboring countries that had significant interest in the war in those countries, partly because of um, the support that they wanted to get, and you know mineral resources. We are always um, part of it, you know. And this is how we ended up having the Kimberley process in South Africa, which was all about giving the diamonds a bath certificate because somehow we needed to show that the diamonds had to come to it from actually their countries that we didn't have conflict. Thank you so much, Maurice. And I'm, I'm pretty sure my audience would be, will have one or two questions. I'm gonna jump straight and to Colin Nee, who I initially introduced, and now he has actually um, <clears throat> taken care of his technical glitch. Nee, you have five minutes on, um, to join us. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Roger, Stephen, my brother, and everybody else. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, we can hear you. Excellent. And, and um, of course, I, before even thanking the organizers, and I do thank them, I apologize for the technical glitch. It wasn't just my computer, it is my old eyes, but they, I think I got them working now. And I have been listening very closely to Rigobert Father Minani, who is actually a close friend of mine. And I hope Bahati won't uh, get mad at me, but I'll say that I pushed to have him on and I learned a lot from him. I'm glad. Um, Mr. Cavota, I learned a lot as well. And of course, Maurice and Claude, we know each other so well that we say when we appear on panels, we should say that truth in our uh, panel discussions, everybody know, should know, we've been friends since um, the, the first invasion of Congo, and we've been working over and over and over. I, I feel like they are my brothers. And so I endorse everything that they have said. Here is what I will add to it. You know, um, number one, when you look at the how the event was framed, it's you know, the crisis between Rwanda and DRC. We know there's been killing and wars there. And so the question, uh, the, the sort of the top question is, okay, why is the war going on? Who is wrong in the war? Because I think if you, if you are a witness to a war, you shouldn't just sit back and say, oh, this doesn't involve me. No matter where you are, it always involves you. You should know who is right and who is wrong? And I can tell you, um, Dr. Roger Stephen mentioned, I have been doing advocacy from Washington, D.C. Yes, I was born in Ghana. I've been doing it from Washington, D.C. This is my 43rd year, 43 years. So I have watched a number of things very closely. And I can tell you, I have watched the Great Lakes and Congo and Rwanda very closely. And my summary conclusion is, the wars in the Eastern Congo, at least where the M23 is involved, Mr. Kagame, General Kagame, uh, Rwanda's president, he is the one who invades the country. He is behind M23. So don't let anybody fool you. He is invading a much bigger country, taking resources. He's now, he's done it with his own army blatantly twice. Now he's doing it hiding behind M23. So please get that. What is causing the war? It is Rwanda ripping up the Congo under the guise of the M23, that's number one. But others have gone in, uh, you know, all the four people who have talked before me and, and even, um, uh, you know, our first uh, moderator, Bahati, who knows a lot about the Congo. So if you can't, everybody who has spoken uh, uh, before me have said this, and I'm saying I agree with them. Rwanda is the one invading the Congo and causing all these problems. And this time it's hiding behind a group called M23. 
So if that was uh, uh, the only issue, I'll say, okay, I'm done. But I do want to add, since uh, this is being done from Washington, we have many uh, uh, people wa um, watching from outside of the Congo and Rwanda. Here is the context that I will give it. You know, um, the Secretary of State, the American Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, was just in Rwanda and Congo and South Africa earlier this month. And so the US is involved. And the question that uh, we have to ask, we also live in a larger uh, global environment. There is war in Ukraine, okay? And it is shaping the international affairs. Even in Africa, there is an insurgency in Mozambique. And incidentally, Rwanda is there saying that it it's helping them to fight off the terrorists. Then, of course, we are talking about the Great Lakes. Then there is war in Somalia. There is war in uh, uh, Ethiopia. Nigeria, the biggest country in Africa, is imploding. The rest of West Africa, where Stephen and I are from, you know, we have problems, uh, security problems. And then as for North Africa, you show me one country that is democratic and stable in North Africa. It cannot be found. So there are security problems, I'm saying, in Africa, in the world. And this is what I want to put in context, because I want um, the U.S. administration to understand, you know, President Biden is saying that the war in Ukraine means that autocracies are competing against uh, uh, democracies and they want African countries to join them that the U.S. is leading the democratic coalition. So if you want to call them that way. And I happen to think that we in Africa, we desperately need democracy. We really need democracy. Not because, not because of what some people call Western democracy. We need it for ourselves. And therefore, normally we will support that. I truly apologize for this. And I don't even know where this is coming from. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lee, can you continue? And I'll just... Yeah, find yes, yes. Stephen, and I'll join you in apologizing because I actually talked to your staff and I said to them, I suspect that given who we are talking about, they will try to interfere using all kinds of people. So I'm not too surprised. I'm glad we cleared the air. I'll make it quick. My point is that it is in the U.S. interest when it is asking African countries to join us in saying Russia is wrong, the world is splitting into autocracy-led faction. It is in U.S. interest to show that when he says it's for it's a democracy and that it supports democracy, it needs to prove its point yes. by withdrawing its support from dictators in Africa. As Claude has mentioned, as uh, Maurice has mentioned, the United States supports too many dictators, has supported too many dictators for too long in mm. Africa. And unless it stops, its own interests are going to be hurt. My final okay. point, Dr. Rogers, is how do we make the U.S. Uh, change that policy of supporting dictators okay. in Africa? Mm -hmm. uh, that that is know. the key. Mm -hmm. And, and yes. that's my core point. Okay. If China supports dictators around Africa, too. And it says, well... We don't, we don't get into your domestic affairs. We don't tell you what to do. And many Africans fall for it. I'll say to fellow Africans, please don't, because we need okay. democracy. China is not our role model. But the United States, here is the point. The only way you make the United States change its policy, here is the magic, here, here, here is the secret sauce, is for groups like us, AFJM, uh, Advocacy Net for, uh, Network for Africa, ADNA, all of us, we have to put pressure. When China is doing something wrong in Africa, ordinary Chinese person cannot do anything because there's no freedom in China. This, this uh, webinar we are doing cannot be done in China, okay? But we are doing it. So I'm saying the ball is in our court. We have to understand that Kagame is a problem and he's being supported by the U.S. After we talk, the next thing we do is let the U.S. government hear from us. I know that works because I worked for 10 years in the anti-apartheid movement and we rolled over President Reagan and forced uh, uh, sanctions over his veto. The American people can do it, but they have to be led by a group of committed, organized people. And I'm saying that is us, that is ADNA, that is AFGN, 
that, that is the people on this panel, that's the people that are watching. We have to do it. If we don't do it, the US government won't change its policy. And if the US government doesn't change its policy, Mr. Kagame will not change his behavior. It is on us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lee, and I thank you. Uh, that, that was such a very refreshing, uh, especially from your perspective and someone who has had a lot of experience on the ground. And you and I share a lot in common. Um, we've we've come so, you know we, we come from West Africa. We're very familiar with uh, chaos. We're familiar with um, you know wars to some extent, even though Ghana hasn't had one in long and pray they don't. But very familiar with Ekumog and obviously um, some of those implications. Also, you 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 live. This, I mean, you're very familiar with South Africa. I taught in the University of Cape Town for a while, so I'm also very, very much into the political economy of that part of the region. You know, and especially comparing to West to West Africa. I want to thank you for a very refreshing perspective to this. And again, I just want to apologize again, not on behalf of uh, corporates or whoever um, um, would. I mean, trying their best to, to get into this, which I find is such a very defeatist position because you can't stop freedom of speech and you cannot really stop people from having a real honest conversation. And so we we are able to see beyond that with that screen, that um, screen, and move on to our conversation. Thank you for staying. Now I wanted to open the floor because I, I'm sure many of you have a few questions. I'd ask some to send them by 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 chat if you can't. But if you want to ask openly, I will give you a chance and you probably will have like at least 30 seconds to ask either an open question or just direct that question to a particular speaker. My three speakers, Nee, Morris, and, um, and, and, and my brother who made a really nice uh, presentation about his story. Claude, would be more than Claude. willing to answer. Yes, well, Claude, I'm sorry, Claude, I think I missed you all. So the floor is open. If you want, just raise your hand and I will be happy to ask you to, to say something quickly. Just ask a question. And if it's if you just want to add something, it should be no more than thirty seconds. Okay. Um, I I I I don't have hands raised yet. I know people had asked a lot of questions on here, but let me let me let me. Oh, okay. I, okay, but I have to before you say something. Um, so I have Wendy and I have Stella. I think I can see Stella. Um, Stella Katumbi, can you just um, briefly in maybe 30, 35 seconds just ask your questions? Welcome. Yes, I just wanted to, to ask, obviously, for these atrocities to happen, cooperations have to be involved, money has to flow, and, you know, are there any highlighted or significant businesses that you know, knowing myself, I'm in the financial service, I'm in audit, I'm in one of the biggest audit firms in the world, Is there, are there entities that you're able to highlight and say, these are the ones that either facilitate or are contributing to the conflict. Okay, thank you so much, Stella. So Stella's question is really about kind of honing down on much more specific issues. I think I understand it, and which I do agree is there are a lot of dynamics to this in terms of how the conflict is being perpetuated or is being exacerbated beyond just its cause. If you can kind of hone in on just the specific ones that need to be addressed, maybe like in order of priority. So um, I think I will leave, I'll open that May, question yeah. to whoever wants to go first. Um, Maurice, do you yes. want to give a stab or me? Okay, Nee, you can give a stab and then Maurice probably yes. will. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it very short. Okay. Um, even though I don't have the name of a specific company, what I will suggest is please check companies that are exporting minerals from Rwanda. Because on Rwanda's territory, they don't have much minerals to talk about but the <laughs> economic statistics talk about a lot of exports. So look who is exporting minerals from Rwanda. That's the category I will look at. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just, just sure. Maurice, Thank you. Also, uh, uh, Wendy, in, in uh, the United Nations has published a, a series of reports that uh, document the countries that have benefited uh, from the, the conflict uh, in the Congo. They listed some 85 uh, companies uh, from uh, their 2001 uh, report. Mm -hmm. And I can uh, post a link uh, in, the, uh, in the chat that provides a listing of those, uh, those companies. Uh, as as we, we, we've stated uh, that uh, even though the United Nations pinpoint Kagami and Museveni as the godfathers of the legal exploitation of the Congo, uh, they're not refining, they're not manufacturing, they're not 
producing uh, finished products. So they're really middlemen uh, for other corporations uh, that are getting Congo's minerals uh, for pennies on the dollar. And the United Nations had documented some 85 uh, companies from throughout the globe that were engaged in the, in the plunder in the, in the Congo. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Ahud, can, can I quickly yes. add to- Yes, oh um, yeah, Claude, go ahead, that, please, please. Yeah, among those 85 companies, um, there were a large number of companies that are actually based in Canada. A number of them are based in the US and many in the European Union in Australia, and in fact, some in South Africa. Um, but the main thing, as Maurice said, he called them middlemen, um, the Kagamis and M70s and their militaries are actually mercenaries that make it happen. It's similar to the, and, and so the corporations, their role is like what the corporations were doing during this, the, the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, where humans were resources. Now what we have is, is, is are the minerals of the Congo. Okay. Then you have the government who legalize the trade. They make it legal uh, with the support of the, the diplomatic, political, and uh, all the other backing of these, uh, these mercenaries. And then you have the local players, the local uh, slave traders, basically. Those are the Kagamis and the Musevenis. If I can use that kind of that triangle that's what we have. So corporations are a big part of it because communities are invaded, people massacred, and then they uh, they flee. When they flee, somebody sh uh, sets up shop and sets up a mine. Many communities have been displaced in order to set up those mines. So as Nee said, take a look at the companies that are exporting, uh, that are receiving exports from Rwanda and, uh, and Uganda. And by the way, that number has spiked. The amount of minerals that are exported out of Rwanda and Uganda spiked exponentially since the year 1997. If you look at the years before, in 1997, it's a big total change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claude. I'm going to go to Wendy. Before I go to Wendy, and I just wanted to add, I think, one line to that. I think um, you're absolutely right. All three of you, like, multinational corporations need to be addressed because um, I know for sure, and I always use this as an analysis from my own perspective, Liberia was importing more diamonds um, abroad than Sierra Leone, which actually produced diamond. And Liberia really didn't produce, or they produced very minimal. And part of that was because obviously it was benefiting from a conflict. So, but then with the Kimberley process, which actually gave, I call them the birth certificates of diamonds, um, that number significantly decreased because those conflict diamonds, which ended up in the hands of people who actually used it as a symbol of love was actually killing somebody somewhere in the field. And once that kind of awareness, I think, came about, those companies found it very unprofitable any longer to trade in those conflict diamonds. And I hope somehow, I think what you guys have, uh, both all three of you are coming to is maybe part of that also in addition to addressing the US and its role is also to, put, to also address some of these corporations that are benefiting from this. I'll go to Wendy, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I put the thing on. I'm sorry, I, it's not working the light, but I wanted to thank you all for all the information that you shared. And um, and I put a, an e uh, a question in the chat. And really, I think because of everything that's going on in the world, um, I'm right now in West Africa um, and um, have resettled here um, from the States. And in Africa and in the States, and I think all over the world, I think that we are at a moment that it would be really unfortunate not to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And that is where everybody is, is like thinking about these issues of oppression, um, repression, um, economic injustice, all of these things are on the minds of everyone. Africans are waking up um, in ways that I haven't seen them in, you know, forever. I think, um, you know, two years ago, we started the George Floyd protest. So, so let's build on this. And the question that I had is that um, I think that the only way that the United States is ever going, because I think that a lot of the policy, the foreign policy is based on what is good for American corporations. Um, and so long as American corporations are making all that money and they've got private landing ships in the forest in Congo, where they just come and go as they wish, um, they're the ones who are pushing our government, the United States government, to do what it does. So how do we make it uncomfortable 
for our political leaders to continue to support this. Part of, I mean, I, I think it maybe has to be like a campaign, but I, what I would like for everybody to think about and communicate to us, you know, we, we rely on you guys to communicate to us, is are there certain issues that you've thought about that we can focus on um, as we contact our, you know, representatives and senators and, you know, everyone else who we need to be contacting, um, the UN, everybody, you know, Africa, do we, we, what do we tell the rest of Africa that is not as aware of what is going on in the Great Lakes region as you guys are? Um, what are the, the key things? I'm, I'm thinking one of them may be like the fact that children are being, are involved in a lot of this mining. That's something that might resonate with American public, but um, I, I don't know. I, I, I just wanted to ask you guys, because I think we have an opportunity when these elections are coming up and we need to take advantage of it. And I would like your guidance on that. Thank you so much, Wendy, for a very, by the way, that's a really good question because part of what we do here is to how do we get this, um, the US engaged in Africa in a very much more organic way. And I think that's a very good question. I wanted to, if one of you guys would take a stab on that, there's one or two questions I wanted to just add from the, from the, from the chat because I think I'd ask people Hab and Randy Long, I think they asked a question which may have been answered, but maybe you can also respond to that. Say, why does the US continue to support Rwanda as they have? What is the objective? So that is from Hab and, and so maybe one of the panelists, we just we just kind of briefly in 30 seconds respond to that. Let me just um, see if I can take one more question. And um, this is from Douglas. And Douglas was asking, what leverage does China have in Rwanda? What will it take for them to consider taking a forceful position? Or will they ever? So um, <clears throat> maybe Ni, nee, you can take one if you want to take the yeah. China question. And yeah. um, if that's good. And um, um, I would ask um, um, my two, Claude and um, Maurice, maybe one of them to respond to Wendy's question. And then the other one from Hab about the US, which pretty much you guys, in some ways, you had addressed that. So take a stop and 30 seconds, please, so that we can ask, take one or two more questions before our time. Go ahead, Neil. Thank you. Uh, yes, on, on China, um, my strong opinion, and it is part of the course that I teach at George, uh, George Washington, uh, China's relations in Africa, vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, Africa's relations with all the major parts of the world. No, mm -hmm. I don't think China is going to quit. Uh, in fact, when President Kagame was the uh, chairman of the uh, uh, African Union, as you know, they rotate. At one point, he said, well, now I like China better because they don't uh, uh, scream at us for human rights, okay? They don't disrespect us by talking to us what we should do. China is also after Africa's minerals and it, it supports dictators because it runs the dictatorship in China. So it worries me that too many Africans have, have um, you know, rosy eye glasses when they are looking at uh, oppression in Africa. Every, anybody who oppresses Africa and steals our resources, we should call them out, China included. As for the coming elections, if you will forgive me, I'll just add this. You know, the U.S. has announced um, a strategy, and it also says it's bringing African leaders here, and of course, in December. And November is the midterm elections, as Wendy said. And so what I will say is when you, uh, the one thing you should, I suggest you should push for, Maurice and, and um, Claude can suggest other things. Let us uh, say to the U.S. government, we want you to show real commitment to democracy in Africa, clean elections, other aspects of democracy, stop supporting the dictators. And if you don't do it, we will not vote for you. So my guidance is make sure that the US is actually supporting democratic elections as a start rather than supporting dictators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ni. I mean, your, your opinions are always very refreshing. Um, Claude, maybe you take a stab on this because as, I mean, I'm just thinking as a young man, as a survivor also of this conflict, Wendy's question, which was more about um, what role do Americans, how, I mean, how do we make the issue important to Americans here? And especially in light of 2024 coup, um, what would be your quick short response to that? Um, 30 seconds, Claude. Yeah, I think uh, seeing what uh, happened, especially in the last few years with the, um, uh, the deportation of children from the U.S. being a hard issue. 
uh, at the southern border of the U.S. Uh, I think we 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 should uh, raise the issue of the use of child soldiers and uh, mm. uh, and sexual slaves because we know we have evidence that in Rwanda school children are being taken from school to, to go to the M23 and go fight with the M23. There's also uh, areas captured by this M23 that are out there um, taking children, putting them, enrolling them into the military. So there's not just the fighting, but there's also the mining. So the use of child labor and the use of child soldiers and um, the, re the use of uh, sexual slaves. No problem. Thank you so much, Claude. And um, Maurice, maybe just a last question uh, I'd asked before, which Hab and Randy had asked. They were concerned. I know you responded to this. You probably just one line, maybe they relate about how does, I mean, how does the U.S. continue to support Rwanda as they have? What is the objective? Um, right. Just... A, a few things around that. It's important to understand that when we talk about the African continent, we're talking about a neo-colonial uh, environment and they're agents of neo-colonialism. And one of those agents is Paul Kagame. Another, of course, is Yuri Museveni. And those agents, what they do is they act on behalf of their suitors, on behalf of the U.S. So they or or France. So they'll go. So you'll find Rwandan troops in Mozambique, uh, in collusion with France and uh, French oil companies. Uh, you'll find uh, Rwanda doing things in Africa that maybe the U.S. doesn't necessarily want to to do um, directly, but. Um, overall, we have to, the, the Congo, I know we're talking about the Congo and the Great Lakes, uh, but it's really emblematic of the continent as a whole. And the continent is still seen today, uh, 100, over 100 plus years after the Berlin Conference, as a theater for competition of great powers. So when you see China coming to the Congo in an economic way, uh, the, the U.S. response to that, to China on one hand and to Russia on the other, is to up the ante with what it does best, and that is to militarize uh, the world. So we see uh, since the advent of AFRICOM in 2008, some 2,000% 2, increase in the militarization of the, of the African continent by the, by the United States, uh, which ultimately serve, uh, it's, it's uh, not only strategic interest, but it's economic interest. Uh, my friend Ni, when uh, I recall when uh, AFRICOM was uh, first uh, introduced uh, through Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush. And he uh, famously said that I can think of a hundred things that Africa needs and more military is not on that list. And I agree to it with him to, to this day. So we see the increased militarization of the, of the continent. Uh, it's with the, the training of, uh, of uh, soldiers, uh, African soldiers that ultimately repress their own population and do nothing to bring about the stability that the U.S. says that it's, uh, it's seeking in Africa, the ending of, of uh, uh, terrorism. In fact, uh, with the increase of the militarization of the continent, we've seen an increase in terrorism um, throughout the continent. So objectively, uh, we have to question what is the ultimate um, purpose? So to answer her question, we're still um, living in a neo-colonial environment uh, where uh, they're willing agents, whether they're in, you know, they're the Paul Diaz of, uh, of Cameroon, uh, Paul Kagamis of Rwanda, or Yaro Museveni uh, of Uganda. So that's something that we have to confront as uh, young Africans at home and young Africans uh, abroad. And the, the Ni mentioned uh, the whole question of the anti-apartheid movement and the victory in the, in the 80s, but the victory didn't just appear poof out of uh, the air. It took decades, decades of political education. And that it is that heavy lifting and hard work that all of our organizations have to do to educate the American public about the role, the role of US foreign policy and the destructive role of UN foreign policy, not only in the Congo, but throughout the African continent as a whole, with the expectation uh, that the US citizens will then be mobilized to hold their governments accountable, not just in midterm elections or presidential elections, uh, but hold them permanently accountable by calling them uh, to, uh, to book for when they increase the militarization of the African <laughs> continent, when they uh, provide cover for mass killers like Agami and Museveni, and when they uh, provide a, a pathway for their corporations to get access to minerals for pennies on the dollar because their, their military is in cahoots with uh, a strong man in Africa. Thank you so much. And we are Steven, out of time. Steven, um, Steven, 
It's it's Amen. twelve o'clock. Let me come, um, Bahati. Just one second before we go. Um, I have um, it's twelve actually, and um, I wanted to just maybe give thirty seconds to David and thirty seconds to Ives, just to if both of them. I promise you, I'm not going to keep you here for more than three minutes above the twelve midday. Um, I promise that if you can just stay around, and then Bahati, you will come on with your. I'm pretty sure you want to kind of um, summarize. Um, David, can you just? What was your question? If you can do that in thirty seconds or less, we will appreciate that. David's iPhone. Okay, Evers, can you? Yes, uh, hey, David. David, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, David. Exactly. Uh, I have been uh, uh, in the, my the parliament in Congo, and mm -hmm. then uh, in the, and uh, I'm in contact constant with uh, my colleague when I were like the former parliament of 2010 mm -hmm. up to 2018. So mm -hmm. what I wanted to add after listening to most of uh, the interventions mm -hmm. is the, the element of uh, the co new Cold War that is okay. starting. Because as we, you, we can notice, uh, we, uh, uh, Kisekedi has sent his uh, minister, uh, defense minister in, uh, in Russia. Okay. So my fear is... Uh, Yes, the United States has done a lot of things, as uh, most of the people have said, but it is pushing. When I, I'm listening to most of my former colleagues, it is pushing uh, people to start uh, really rejecting the West, specific the United States. And that is very big danger. So I would say we have the proverb that always say, when two elephants are fighting, it's the grass that suffers. Okay. So I want you to add that element that it is really becoming serious. And even when we have to talk about the United States, the Russia is coming and a lot of colleagues, former colleagues and a lot of leaders in Congo start wanting to lean towards Russia, and which is what has happened with Lumumba and all the others. So that Thank was my point I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And by the way, that was a really, that was a very good point because, uh, you know, it's also important to look at that aspect of it in terms of, you know, uh, the history of Congo and how, you know, the president's own perspective actually changes that. Now, I'm going to end this. And Bahati has put his hand up. Bahati, if you want to just quickly chime in and before I kind of summarize this. And thank you so much for being so patient. It's 12, 3 after 12. Yes, Bahati, quickly. Um, I just wanted to request that Claude um, address uh, briefly what happened to the hacking because he has been also hacked before. Uh, Claude, uh, if you can uh, inform our public what we are against. Thank you. Okay. So um, yeah. thank you, Bahati. So as a way of closing, first of all, let me just start by saying thank you all of our I mean, our guests, I mean, wonderful presentations. And the thing I like about these kinds of panels, especially the way we organize it, is to provide diverse perspective, you know, from academic, from people on the ground, from activists, from survivors of this, because it gives you a much more holistic picture of what's happening on the continent. The idea is for our audience to you know, listen to that and make their own conclusions. AFJN does not subscribe to any particular political view um, we don't subscribe to particular conflict from a particular perspective. Um, our focus is on Africa and to make sure that there's just relations with the US and also to advocate for the things that develop the continent. Now, what happens normally, these kinds of conversations can be very messy. And obviously people have very passionate perspective about it. And we obviously saw that here, not from the people who came, but from those who actually tried to come in and kind of um, you know, distract it a again. Our position is we are never shy of, of, of having these kinds of conversations. That's exactly why we are here. We are here to have these conversations in a very organic way. And so we want to apologize that um, for that um, little glitch and that people were able to um, infiltrate. Uh, what we will do in the future, which I think I just had a conversation with some of my colleagues, is to make sure that we kind of even more tighten our security about how people log into to our, to our Zoom so that they don't bomb it because they are not necessarily excited about the conversation we are having. And we open this sort of conversation to as many people as they can. We want them to be part of it and they have an opportunity to, to, um, to ask their questions. And that's why we're here. But we will not, again, we will not let anyone stop these conversations because somehow 
they either represent a view that they are not willing to express openly. So I want to thank you. I want to thank Bahati. Um, I know you're very passionate about these kinds of issues and you always push us to have these conversations. And we are always happy, especially if we have the time and the opportunity to do so. We want to thank you all. We want you to you know, log into AFJN and see some of our upcoming issues. Um, the elections that just happened in Kenya and you know, there's a new organic movement. Nigeria is coming up and you know, we see that there is a movement of young people who are now excited about politics for the first time after so many years of apathy. We are going to follow those events carefully and we are going to bring in the leading experts so that they can talk about it. I want to thank you and I want to thank myself, Lydia and Bahati for putting this together. And thank you everyone. And you have a very wonderful, wonderful Thursday. And you bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.